Hey y'all, it's Michael. Welcome to the Frisco Community Church Sermons Podcast, where we explore teachings from the Bible and learn how they apply to our daily lives. No matter your past, background, or where you are in your faith journey, you're welcome at FCC, and I hope the following message helps you draw closer to Jesus. Well, hey, good morning. My name is Michael, and uh, if you're visiting today, uh, I get the joy to serve as the lead pastor here at Frisco Community Church. I would truly love to get to know you and your story. If you're joining us online and we haven't connected, shoot me an email or send a a note in the chat. We'd love to connect. Uh, Do me a favor, and let's bow our heads and pray and go to the Lord before I open up his word. Lord Jesus, it is so good to be in your presence. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come into this place right now. Fill this room. Fill our hearts. Remove any distractions that may be in the back of our mind, in the front of our mind, going on, whether it's relational, whether it's something financial, whether it's something physical, anything that is distracting us from hearing your word right now. Holy Spirit, remove those distractions. We lay them at the foot of your cross. Likewise, Holy Spirit, speak through me. If there's anything I've prepared that you don't want me to say, strike it from my lips. But Jesus, if there's something that you want to say through me that we haven't prepared, speak it through me. I'm your vessel. Jesus, become greater in all of our lives. We ask this in your name. Amen. So this is going to be a little bit of a different sermon than typically uh, what I do. Typically, I like to just pick a group, uh, a text and work through it and, and just kind of work exegetically through the text. And, and today is a little bit different. It's a little bit more story time. And uh, I am sorry that for the introverts, Lindsay made a promise. There is a meet and greet. I'm just moving it around. So here's what I would love you to do as we kick off. Introverts, you have a pass, all right? If you want, you can just sit there um, and, and just close your eyes, look like you're praying, and everybody will leave you alone. Um, I'm going to put a phrase on the screen right here. And what I want you to do is discuss with everyone the first thing that pops into your head when you see that phrase. For those of us joining us online or in the podcast, the phrase is, the church is on fire. Go ahead and talk about that for a few minutes, and I'll be right back. All right, all right, all right. Introverts, you can check back in now. It's good, it's good. All right, so I would love to know what y'all got. So raise your hand or shout out if any of you got this. That, show show of hands, okay, that's what you got? All right, that's that's a little bit fewer than I thought. By the way, these are all AI generated. Uh, The prompts are kind of interesting. I may wind up on some FBI watch list um, as I talked about burning churches uh, into AI generators. Uh, Okay, so some of you got uh, a church building on fire. What about this? Maybe glasses half empty kind of folks. The church is on fire. It's, it's, on, a, it's on a downward spiral. It's, it's on its way out. It's, it's, it's closing. It's, it's doom and gloom. It's just it, it, there's no, no hope for future. Anybody kind of get that one? A couple of you? All right. What about this one? This is Pentecost, right before Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came in like tongues of fire over uh, the people gathering in that room. Did y'all get that? Like, it's a time of revival. The church is on fire. We're seeing people come to know Jesus. There's so many things going on. Yeah, so many, you got some of that? Okay. Anyone else get just something different? Anybody? Yeah? What'd you get, Matthew? Throw, Throw it out there. Okay. I love that. The church is doing good. Like, the church is fire. Like, okay, see? All of my kids just cringed a little bit. That's amazing. So the church means a lot of different things to a lot of people, as well as AI. If you put in a prompt to AI that said, show me the church, this is what you get. Four different pictures of four different images. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. For most of us in the room, it's probably positive. I I would assume a lot of people here generally have a positive view of the church. Maybe uh, memories of vacation Bible school or some Sunday school. You had a Sunday school teacher that you just loved, something like that. Or some of your best lifetime friendships and relationships are part of the church. And maybe some of you, the idea and thought of church is actually a little bit more of a negative connotation. 
you've experienced the overreach of a life group leader, or maybe a pastor or an elder or a deacon abusing their power a little bit. And so you have a little bit of church hurt as a result of that. Unfortunately, that's a phrase, church hurt, that's pretty common. And I doubt many of you in the room think this. It, this takes it a, a whole step further, but I have friends, I have neighbors, I have family members that believe the church is a perpetrator of evil. Think about that. And unfortunately, they're, they're not terribly wrong, right? I mean... <laughs> When the church drifts, people get hurt. And I made a bold statement a couple of weeks ago when I was up here, and I said that we believe that the church has drifted from its primary purpose. And it has. And we've seen that. We've seen people get hurt. For too long, too many people have perpetrated atrocities in the name of Jesus. We don't have to look very far in history to see that. I mean, just this year alone, we've seen this in the news, right? We've, we've heard stories. It's been in the, in the morning news. It's been on national news. And we've heard stories of um, pastors and church leaders with extramarital proclivities, abusing their leadership power and lording it over people in an oppressive way. We've heard stories of pastors and church leaders being arrested for felonies that they've committed, mostly online. And that is just North Texas this summer, y'all. It's, it's, it's just, it's rough. When the church drifts, people get hurt. And we are at a place right now that would be heartbreaking for the early church planners, for the people who were first starting out this thing, this organization, if you will, after Jesus' death and resurrection. And our current church model that we've been doing for about the past 1,500 years is so far, it is distant so far. The way that we view and do church, even us in this room, is so far different and so far departed from what the early church planners thought and what they experienced, that if you showed them the definition of church in a dictionary, any English dictionary right now, this is how they would respond. Oh no, God! No, God, please, no! 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 Anytime you can get Michael Scott and Toby into something. Okay, it's a little extreme. But, and you may be thinking even that's a little blasphemous. I don't think it is, y'all. I think that the church planners, the early church planners would be on their knees and they would be like, God, no, no, no. No, we have drifted so far from what it was. And to understand how we got there, to understand how we've drifted, to understand why we are where we are today, we just need to do a little bit of a history lesson. We're going to jump in and look at some church history today. It's going to be awesome for those of you who love church history like I do. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Acts chapter 9. I'm going to read from the New International version. And we're going to bounce around a little bit, but we're going to spend a little bit of time in Acts. So that's going to be a decent place to just kind of keep a bookmark or your thumb in there. It's important to know that when the church started, it, was, it didn't even have a name and it wasn't a religion. It was considered this sect, this offshoot of Judaism. And nobody really knew what it was. And, and, and we see that it actually kind of had a name in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 2. We first see the name of this. It's called The Way. No one really knows why it was called The Way. There's many different theories, but at the end of the day, what we know is it was called The Way, and we don't know why. Acts chapter 9, verse 1 says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that he found So that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. See, the Roman Empire wanted the way extinguished. They wanted it done. They didn't like it. It was disrupting their order and disrupting their powers. And so what they did is they enabled these zealots like Saul to go persecute the the followers of the way. 
And these followers had a nickname that we still also don't know where it came from or who coined it, but we see it in extra biblical writing. We see it in Roman history. We see it in Jewish history. Um, And it was called the Christ ones, the Christ ones, because these people were followers of Jesus the Christ. And so that is Christ ones where we actually get Christians from. And so with all of these zealots uh, enabled, they, it just got bad for the early church. They were persecuted. We talk about being persecuted for our beliefs here. We are not persecuted. Um, we're just not. We may get harassed or you know pushed a little bit, but we don't get persecuted really here in America. What was going on with these folks, the persecution that they were getting? Forget being thrown into jail and stuff like that. They were beaten. They were physically beaten, um, you know, sometimes stoned, you know, taken within, you know, inches of their life. Uh, they were also, this is kind of, kind of fun, uh, they were set on fire. They, they were burned alive. That's, that's what some people did to the Christ ones. And then also some of them, they were put in the Colosseums in Rome and then fed to tigers and lions. It was sport for people in the empire to watch. And that is stuff that happened to these early Christ ones. But for some... Some people endured what was called the extreme punishment. Extreme punishment. Like, because being set on fire and fed to lions is not extreme enough. And the extreme punishment is crucifixion. It was believed to be the most extreme, the most painful, the most torturous way to die. They developed it that way because they wanted to set an example to everyone of not to challenge Rome. And it's the same death that Jesus died. And some of these folks experienced the same death. Because of this climate, they had to gather in secret. Pliny the Younger, a Roman historian, said they had met regularly before dawn on a fixed day. That fixed day was Sunday. They did that in honor of Jesus' resurrection the day that he died. So if you ever wondered... Why do we worship on Sundays? That's why, in that tradition. Dawn on a fixed day to chant verses alternately amongst themselves in honor of Christ, as if to God. So they had to go meet on the outskirts of town early in the morning before the sun came up, early in the morning before they went to work. They, they, they had to go work. They, they, there was no day off. Sometimes they would meet in homes, in the secrecy and privacy of a home behind closed doors. Sometimes they actually met in public and hid in public. And what they would do is they would just stand in a big giant circle all the way around and they would talk and converse. And the reason that they did that in the circle is because people could see 360 degrees around and tell if there was going to be a threat that was coming. Sorry, I do not want to cough into my microphone. Nobody wants that either. And this behavior perplexed them. The challenge also is these folks were trying to hide. They were trying to meet in secret, but they lived so radically different than the culture that they stood out like sore thumbs. They couldn't hide. Tacitus was another historian, was perplexed. He said, the Christ ones accept people from every walk of life gathering in unity. He was perplexed that the Christ ones accepted people from every walk of life gathering in unity. My, how far we've drifted. And the way it kept growing and growing and growing. And Rome saw it as a threat to their power, a threat to their control of the empire. And so at one point in time, a Roman emperor, the king of Rome, if you will, sent this guy called Aristides to go infiltrate. He's like a spy. Go infiltrate the way and figure out how we can stop it, because they were failing miserably at stopping the way. And this is what Aristides wrote to the emperor about the way. They love one another. And he who has gives to him who has not, without boasting. And when they see a stranger, they take him into their own homes and rejoice over him as a very brother. And if there is any among them that are poor and needy, and if they have no spare food, they fast for two or three days in order to supply to the needy their lack of food. Such, O king, is their manner of life, and verily, this is a new people, and there is something divine in the midst of them. This is how everything 
started. A group of people called the Christ Ones. In a movement called The Way. And they stuck out like sore thumbs. They could not hide. The next time we see the word the way, the phrase the way is a little bit later in Acts in chapter 19 if you want to scroll or flip over there. And it was in verse 23 where he says, about that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. This is a very small or very big understatement. Okay, so Saul, the guy that we just read about, who was enabled and empowered by Rome and got these letters to go persecute people in Damascus. Well, Saul became a follower of the way. It's awesome. And you can read about that story in Acts also. We don't have time for that. So now what Saul is doing as a follower of the way is he's going all over the world and telling people about the way. And he's preaching about it. And people's lives are changing. At this point in time, he is in Ephesus. And while he's going on there, so many people are becoming followers of the way that the silversmiths in Ephesus are taking notice. And the reason being is because people are starting to buy fewer and fewer idols. See, these guys provided the idols for all of the worship. And Paul was saying to them, hey, you don't need to do that. They're not real gods. You got a real God. His name's Jesus. And you don't need an idol to worship them. And so the silversmiths were so upset that they tried to run him out of town. It caused quite the kerfuffle. It says in verse 32, the assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people didn't even know why they were there. So the silversmiths started a riot in Ephesus. And Paul and his followers are like, I'm out of here. Let's go. We can bounce. And then right here in this phrase, in this context, and in this verse, 32, We see something, something different, something special, something called the church. The word right there in verse 32, the assembly was in confusion, is actually in the Greek, the Greek word ekklesia. And ekklesia means an assembly or a congregation. That's what it means. It doesn't mean church. It's not translated church right here. Ecclesia shows up in the New Testament 114 times. Five times it is translated assembly. Three of those times is in Acts chapter 19. The other 109 times it is translated church. And scholars agree, I agree, there is so much energy behind this that this is a very unfortunate translation of the word ecclesia because... <clears throat> It is not church. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my ecclesia, my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. He's saying this is my ecclesia, this is my assembly, my congregation. He's not talking about a building. He's not talking about a temple. He did that on purpose. He was very intentional in the word he used. He could have used a different word if he were going for that, but he said assembly. Matthew saw it, witnessed it firsthand. Matthew is the one who wrote this and documented it in Greek, is ecclesia. So if Jesus was so intentional about this in ecclesia, why is church what shows up in the English Bible? Well, this is where we get really nerdy about church history, and I love it. Okay, so there's this guy named Constantine. It's about 400 years, 380 actually, after Jesus' resurrection. And Constantine shows up and he's like, you know what? I'm going to make the way the official religion of the Roman Empire. Constantine could do that because he just happened to be the Caesar. He was the emperor over, um, over the empire. And he could do that. And he made Christianity the official religion of Rome. And so you would think, yeah, yay, cool, a Christian nation. This is exactly what we want. Not exactly. Things didn't really go well. It didn't turn out well. So there were some neat things, right? What happened, first of all, is the followers of the way, they didn't have to hide anymore. What they could do is they started actually renting out buildings. The early, early church, there's documentation that the early church goers rented out buildings so that they could gather Um, A lot of times what they did is overtake old temples where nobody was worshiping anymore because they were being converted. Eventually, we started to see these beautiful churches and these amazing cathedrals that we have in Europe now that are built and just absolutely stunning. 
During this time, also what happened is we got our first Bible. It was written in the Latin Vulgate. And a guy named Jerome was the one who was behind all of that. The Pope at the time was like, hey, we need a Bible. We need to be able to teach everybody from this. And so they printed the Bible in Latin. Latin's a dead language right now, but back then it wasn't dead. And that is the language that they taught. And that's where we had with that. So they're no longer in hiding. The first Bible is made. They're worshiping in public, and it is kind of awesome. But what happened is they renamed these temples. And there's this word here that we see show up a little bitty bit in the New Testament. It shows up in Revelation, and it shows up in 1 Corinthians. And it's kuriakos, and it means the Lord's. So when we see this in Corinthians, Paul is writing about the Lord's Supper, actually. So that is the Lord's Supper is the context. But what happened is they would go into these temples or they would go into these structures where they were starting to gather. They would call it the Lord's house, the Lord's temple, house of the Lord. That is what it was called. And that's what they started meeting in. And so we see this word show up. And that's kind of what they started calling it, the house of the Lord. And that's how ecclesia turned into church. So if you check this out, you had house of the Lord, and that's what was going on, probably about four or 500, B, um, eight, um, what do we call it, current era now, CE? There we go. I'm, <laughs> I'm a Gen Xer, man. It's BC and AD for me. Okay. And so what happened is as the gospel started spreading into Europe and people started to talk and gather We had the Saxons, which are Germans, if you want to know a little bit, and they had a word for house of the Lord, and it was Kirk. Kirk is what they called it. And then what happened is it made its way over the channel and over into England, and in very old English, you have a word right here that's Kirch, Kirch. And so you can see the etymology of Kirk, Kirch, Church, of what we have now. That is how we got from Ecclesia to church. And that's unfortunate because ecclesia is not a building. It's not what Jesus intended. A church, the definition of church, if you go look it up, is a building for public Christian worship or rites where you can do baptisms and you can do your sacraments and take Holy Communion and have weddings. That is not what Jesus had in mind when he said, hey, this guy Peter this rock on him, I'm going to build my ecclesia. That's not what he had in mind at all. The church is the activity. It is the living, breathing activity of the Holy Spirit through God's people. That's what the church is. Let that sink in. This is what it was back then. We have drifted so far. There's a scholar I don't know if you know this, but there's Bible dictionaries. It's awesome. You, know, you get to like read Bible dictionaries. And um, there's a scholar, Don Robinson, who says it this way. Church is not a synonym for people of God. It is rather an activity of the people of God. It's what caused the way to spread so much and so fast. That's why people hated them. It was the activity of God in his people. So inquiring minds want to know, Why didn't someone change it? If church is wrong, why didn't it change? Well, this is fascinating. I want you to remember the story about the silversmiths for a minute. Just remember that and see if something kind of starts to show up here in this narrative. So fast forward from the fourth century to about the 1500s. And the churches have grown. Again, we've got these big giant cathedrals. We're kind of at the end of the medieval age. The Renaissance is coming and it's beautiful, but there's a problem. The church is everywhere, but there is a problem. The problem is nobody knows what's being said at church services. Because for over a thousand years, the Bible was in Latin. And masses, church services, were being presented in Latin. Anybody raised Catholic? If you've been raised Catholic, I promise you, you've heard Latin in church service. And you're like, what the heck is going on? So it was the Latin Vulgate Bible. There were very few. They were massive. They were handwritten. They weren't even pressed yet. And the way that you would learn them is you would learn from it is you would have to go hear the priest teach it. But the problem is, again, the priest taught it in Latin. And what happened is as people grew and the cultures grew, people grew away from Latin and they started having their own languages. 
And the thought of the day was, well, Latin is the language of scholars. That's what we do for science and mathematics and theology. And so we don't need anything in the common language of the common folk because they can't handle it. This is supposed to be up with the theologians. Are you starting to see a little bit of a drift here? This is very, very different. Very different than Jesus taking his word to some unlearned Galilean fishermen. Remember, it was the official religion of the Roman Empire. So if something becomes official, that automatically coming with it comes control. And there was control. And the church began to become an institution of control and of power. The way ceased being known for the way it treated people, a diverse people of unity, and meeting their needs. And it turned into an institution of control and power. If you control the people You control what's taught to them. If you control what's taught to them, you control what they think. And this is what was happening. There was no accountability. Until again about the 1500s, when some dude named William Tyndale shows up. Anyone know this name? William Tyndale? All right. You guys, some of you know your church history, your church fathers. You know your reformers. William Tyndale was a disruptor. William Tyndale was a scholar. He was a theologian. He was a priest in England. And he had a burden in him that people needed to be able to read the living word of God in their own language so that the living word of God could transform their lives as opposed to having to read it in Latin, a language that most people didn't know anymore at the time. He was brilliant. He knew seven different languages. So what he did is he translated the Bible into English. He went into the original Hebrew in the Old Testament. He went to the original Greek in the New Testament and even some Aramaic that was in the Gospels, and he translated it into English. Now, most people would think this is awesome, right? You're like, woo, Greek, great, great. No more Latin. We've got an English Bible in England. No, the Church of England did not like that. Why? Well, what happens if we have common people reading God's Word? If we have common people reading God's word, they could understand what it means, and they could challenge what we teach. I don't have time to get into all the church history, but again, at this time, it was an institution of control and power, very political, horrible, horrible, horrible things done in the name of Jesus and for God. And so they were worried about controlling the people. These people could challenge our doctrine. They could challenge our theology. They could challenge how we apply God's word. I didn't really see it coming, but it sounds a little bit like these silversmiths who were worried about losing their money, who were worried about losing their power and control in Ephesus. You have these priests and these bishops, and these cardinals, worried about losing control within the church. They weren't happy about it. So, Tyndale was undeterred, and he actually had to flee to Germany And he went to Germany about the time this thing called, this guy named Gutenberg showed up, and he invented this thing called a printing press. And then all of a sudden, Tyndale's Bible, translated into English, started getting snuck into England. And then he would go into England every now and then because he's smuggling them in there, new copies of the New Testament specifically at this point in time. And he got brought into tribunals in front of the church leadership on a consistent basis. He was being charged with heresy. The reason being is there was a sticking point for William Tyndale. As he was looking at the original languages, as he was looking at what to translate, again, every word has, not always is it word for word translation. Anybody knows a couple of different languages, you know that. But as he got to the word ecclesia, he translated it congregation. You can go online right now to anywhere. It's open source. It's free, common um, out there. Translation of the Tyndale Bible in English. Anytime Ecclesia shows up, all 114 times, it is translated congregation because that's what it meant. That's what he thought, and that's what it meant. But the Church of England did not like them, and he brought them into a tribunal. So this next part, I need some helpers. If you see your name up on the screen, would you come on down? There we go. Come on down. Stephanie and Presley, here we go. So here's what we're going to do. We're just going to do a little exercise. Uh, Presley's coming down. I asked Presley to come help because I don't know if you know this, but Lindsay, with the students at the beginning of the school year, had everybody do a spiritual gifts test. And I asked Lindsay, I was like, hey, who of the students um, said that one of their gifts was teaching? Man. 
And Presley's, one of her gifts was teaching. Come on over here a little bit closer, y'all. And so I was like, well, let's give Presley an opportunity to come teach. Speaking of teachers, this is Stephanie, a good friend of Mars and in our, in our life group. Um, she is a teacher. She's a prof. She is brilliant. And um, I texted her earlier this week, and I was like, hey, Stephanie, how's your Latin? And she said, bene. <laughs> right? It was good. I chuckled. It was so ha- I was so happy. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to read Romans 16.1 a verse that has the word ekklesia in it in Greek. It's going to be horrible. Only one of you, I think, even knows, so that's okay. And then Stephanie is going to read it in Latin from the Vulgate Bible. And then Presley is going to read it from the Tyndale Bible. Sound good? I want you to listen to see if you can hear the connections and maybe the changes. <clears throat> Romans 16.1. They sunistimi su ego adelphe febe ke imi Diakonos o ecclesia o en kin crea. Commendo autem vobis, foibem sororem nostram, quae est ministra ecclesiae, quae est cencris. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a minister of the congregation of Kencrea. Thank you very much. William Tyndale believed ecclesia should be translated congregation so deeply that he died for it. He was ultimately found guilty of being a heretic. He was tied to a stake where they wrapped a rope around him and tightened it and tightened it and tightened it until he was asphyxiated, and then they burned him at the stake as a heretic. The problem is the church was trying to control something that cannot be controlled. See, the church is the activity of the Holy Spirit through God's people, and you cannot control that. The Holy Spirit cannot be controlled. You can control an institution, but that is not what Jesus set out to do. That is not what the way was. That is not what the original followers were. At one of Tyndale's trials, he said, Let it not make thee despair, neither yet discourage thee, O reader, that it is forbidden thee in the pain of life and goods, or that it is made breaking of the king's peace, or treason unto his highness, to read the word of thy soul health. In other words, don't be discouraged that if you read this, the trouble may come to you from the English government. For if God be on our side, what matter maketh it? Who be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? Whether it's bishops, cardinals, or popes. Tyndale did not go quietly into the night. Ecclesia had drifted into an institution of control and power. And it is the activity of the Holy Spirit through God's church. This is the ecclesia that Jesus talked about with Peter. This is the ecclesia that Jesus said will not be overcome. Nothing can overcome it. Yet we live in fear. We live in anxiety that something will ultimately come in and squash our rights as followers of Jesus. There is nothing that can overcome this, okay? Okay. Rome literally tried to kill it, and it did not work. No political ideology is going to overcome it. No fear, no sickness, no injury. Nothing is going to overcome what Jesus did. Nothing. Because it is the movement. It is the activity of the Holy Spirit in God's people and through God's people. You cannot stop it. The Apostle Paul, this guy who was initially persecuting people, later in his life wrote a letter to some Christians in Corinth. And he says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? He's telling them, your bodies are the house of the Lord. Your bodies are the house of the Lord. It's not a temple. It's not a living room. It is your body. That is where the Holy Spirit dwells. Your body, you are the church. You individually are the church. 
We collectively are the church. And not only that, not only are we collectively the church, we are the church here in India, in Asia, in the Middle East, in North America, in South America. We are the church. The church is the activity of the Holy Spirit through God's people. And Paul is trying to say, look, Jesus came to disrupt. Just like Tyndale was disrupting in the church in England in the 1500s and became a reformer that started the Protestant movement with Martin Luther and all these other great informers, reformers. Just like that, Jesus came to upend the religious institution of power and control with the first century Jewish temple worship. And in fact, he said the temple would be destroyed. 40 years later, it was, and it has not been rebuilt. There's no need for a temple because you are the temple. He lives in you. So it's hard, especially in an election year where we have all these fears of so-and-so is this, so-and-so is that. I mean, it's just crazy, actually. It's like, it's not even real. If there's aliens watching us, they're laughing at us right now. But nothing's going to overcome the assembly. Nothing is going to overcome the ecclesia that Jesus started all those years ago. And this is what we need to anchor ourselves to. Yeah, it's a history lesson, but it right sets our minds. It right sets our thinking on what the church is and who we are. And all the way back to those pictures, you're looking at the church and it's like, ah, oh, it's a church on fire. It's a church that's, you know, on decline. It's a church that's growing. I want to challenge you. Do you know the two fastest growing Christian populations in the world? Does anybody know them? China, where else? Anywhere else? Another guess? India, that's a good guess. China and Iran. What is going on there right now, the stories that are coming back from missionaries, is nothing short of miraculous. It is like we're reading the book of Acts when we hear letters from these missionaries. And these Christ ones do not have a building where they can meet. They have to meet in secret. They have to meet underground. And it's growing like wildfire. Growing like wildfire. I was just in India a couple of weeks ago. And I had the pleasure to, get, to meet this pastor um, who lives up in northern India. And he was out on bail because he was busted for possessing a Bible. Now, you may be wondering, like, what's going on in India? Well, in northern India, there's four states where it's very, very illegal to become a Christian. You can't proselytize, you can't share the gospel, can't even own a, own a Bible. The Hindu nationalism up there has gotten out of control. A little bit further south, it's a little bit more okay. Where I was in the um, urban areas is okay, in the rural areas, not so much. You, you're gonna get a little bit of um, harassment. But he talked about how the church is growing like crazy and that they're praying to be arrested so they can go to jail, so they can be a witness. They consider it an honor to suffer for their faith, to be beaten, to have their homes ransacked, to have their homes burned. This is going on in the world right now. And this is the church. It's the activity of the Holy Spirit through his people. Would you pray with me? Father God, we love you. Lord, we love your church. Thank you for the reminder that it's more than simply a building. Lord, as we as a congregation, as we as an assembly of Christ ones gather today, we gather in unity with the Christ ones all around the world. Northern hemisphere, Southern hemisphere, all the different languages, the different tribes, the different tongues of all the different nations. Jesus, let us have that kingdom perspective, that kingdom mindset of what it's like to be the church. And Jesus, would you bring your Holy Spirit into this place and unleash your Holy Spirit through us? Lord, we want to disrupt the status quo of church in America. And the only way that that's going to happen is if you are working in and through us, if you are having your way, if you are using us to be your church in the community. Father, I pray that you would begin this in us. It would start today. 
love you. Thank you and pray all of this in your name. Amen. Thank you for listening today. If you haven't already, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and our YouTube channel. If you'd like to learn more about Frisco Community Church, please visit friscocc.org. Until next time, may the God of the universe work with you, in you, and through you. Have a blessed day.